Hey there, hunters, and welcome back to the Gunner's Guild. After the last episode took a detour and is featured elsewhere on Sarah's channel, we're back home now. And today, the two of us are going to continue on our coverage of monsters and how they've evolved throughout the years. To recap, we've already covered the good and bad changes with monsters such as Glavinus, Rajang, Rathlos, and Basil Geese, but today's video will be a little bit different. Today, we're going to celebrate monsters that, for whatever reason, haven't really changed too much and stayed consistent throughout the ages. You see, there's a lot to be praised about some monsters who don't evolve much over the years, and we reckon that they still have their place. Having a familiar face between games, or even a level appropriate challenge for a new player that teaches you the ropes can have a multitude of benefits. Whether it's testing damage for a new set, new game mechanics, or even trying out a different weapon, it's good to have a living, breathing punching bag to throw down with. See, historically each generation of Monster Hunter has mostly a returning roster, with a few additions. But even when that's the case, the returning fights can undergo a lot of changes. Hit zones can completely change how you approach a fight or have to position. Plus, movesets and AI can be completely overhauled as well. Think about Rathlos between 4th Gen, World, and Rise. They're all entirely different fights, especially the last one. And this is the reason why consistency still matters. Yes, of course, we all want new monsters, and it can be a bit hit and miss whether or not a reworked monster is something we prefer over a past iteration, as you've seen in this series. Having the old reliables still helps players integrate with new games and new weapons, allowing players to have a test dummy that actually fights back. The training area dummies we've seen in World and Rise are great, but they don't provide much in the form of combat training in a proper context. So what we're looking for is a good fight, one that's reliable and consistent through the years, and one that helps teach players to hunt properly. What's the criteria for this? First and foremost, it's a fat, juicy hit zone. Nothing gives the hunters solid visual and audio confirmation that they're doing well, or at least progressing. While we have damage numbers now, in older games this was done with indicators such as blood splashes and hit lag that made your attacks feel a bit chunkier. Of course, staggers are a good indication as well, since the monster physically stops moving around as well as flinches. Whatever it is, needs to encourage players to hit it in the right place. Another aspect of great fights for learning are monsters with taunts or ending animations that give players openings to attack. Too much of this can be overkill for sure, take Ryze's Rajang for example, but a few definitely do some good, as a small reward for surviving a long combo. And lastly of course, the monster can't be low tier, nothing that dies in two hits like Izuchi or Kulu. Clearly we're talking about Nergigante, right? I mean, you'd be surprised. It's yes and no. While he does fit all the criteria very well, and he was the most speedran monster in the world for a good reason, we don't actually have any other games to compare him to sadly, so instead, if you can't guess already by all the footage so far, we're going to be showcasing the Rathian and the Narkakuga fights. Big intro, I know. Let's start with Rathian, since she's literally in every Monster Hunter game. You'd think that with all the changes to the game over the years, that she'd have a huge variety of movesets, hit zones, and gimmicks. But actually, unlike Rathalos, it's quite the opposite. And Rathian hasn't changed much at all, immediately setting her up to be the potential old reliable. Rathian is like the perfect hunt for teaching new players how to properly play the game, and she's still a great fight for skilled hunters as she can be easily abused once her fight is mastered. But let's get through her best features. BJ shut up. Rathian's consistency is largely held up by her big, enormous, juicy chin. You degens. Her chin. Her chin is one of the best hit zones in the entire franchise, and consistently so. Typically this hit zone is around 90 in older generations, and while lower in 5th gen, it's still around 65 to 75, which is still incredibly abusable considering a typical weak zone is somewhere between 45 and 55. It's juicy. We talk about hit zones a lot, but they really do change everything about the fight. With Rathian having this big target on her face, it helps promote aggressive play to take advantage of it, and rewards players for accurate swings with staggers, dunks, and a quicker hunt. Everything about the Rathian fight can be linked back to this chin. Let's take a look at her attacks. One of the first things that a lot of people will tell you about the Rathian fight is that she's super annoying and charges around all the time. The instant charges of older generations is gone, yes, but it is a scar on the hearts of experienced hunters that's felt to this day. It is the biggest downside to the fight though, and it's specifically there to push people away from the aforementioned face. Thankfully, it's almost never life-threatening in terms of the damage done. So, it helps teach players that they can't just sit in front of her and walk away unmolested. So knowing that she charges gives Hunter that feeling of, we're playing a turn-based game. I swing, and she swings. So you know that you can come in for a hit, and then back up being aware that she may charge you. Even though she charges, her head hit zone does give more experienced Hunters the ability to head snipe and stop her mid-charge. 
It's a risk versus reward attack for sure that most hunters, myself including, still dislike, but it is a necessary evil to teach hunters how to space properly, punish, and avoid further damage. Outside of her instant charging, Rathian does follow a very specific set of rules for her fight that does let hunters learn everything they need to know about how to take her down. I'll go over a brief list of examples of her fight and how much you can learn from her. First, Double Tail Spin. Always recognize this one. Pretty much all flying wyverns have had this forever, except, you know, world. So you know that when you see one, you can expect a second and position yourself accordingly. Next, her Fireball, another signature of Rathian, is also incredibly easy to spot and predict. While there are three variations, a normal shot, a triple burst, and a large explosive burst, her single shot fireball is only done in a neutral state, and it turns into the three shot fireball when enraged. The big blast is only ever done in enraged state, and she has an inhale sound effect to telegraph it as well as backing up. With how easy it is to predict fireball placement, you can easily position around her head to get in some free damage during these. And of course, Rathian has her notorious tail flips and dunking. Since her head hit zone is so juicy, she's prone to getting dunked out of the air. In older generations, Rathian would fly and then strafe over to the hunter before doing this tail flip in the air, and it's another example of a very one-dimensional but dangerous attack that grants you enough time to get those juicy head snipes in. Rathian also has her backflip from the ground, which was less frequently used in older generations, but since 5th gen has become her main form of going airborne. She also indicates this attack very well by screeching as she's about to perform it. These attacks have largely been unchanged throughout the ages, and because of this, most hunters always know what to expect and how to deal with her. Even if that's the case though, she's never really been a fan favorite fight. It's not for being bad, it's just that she's got these old tricks that people just kind of have learned to deal with, so she's nothing really exciting. But she has always been consistent, with little changes to her moveset. Probably due to Rathian having so many alternate forms, such as Pink Rathian, which has a high emphasis for fireballs and weaker poisons. There's also Dread Queen and Gold Rathian having a much more expansive moveset that change a lot from their base form. That's not to say that Rathian itself has not changed at all. She has developed new moves, usually taking from these and adding to her repertoire. But largely, her game plan has been the same old same old, with fireballs and charge. Rathian is just one of those fights that have been a great wall monster forever. She's usually the first large flying wyvern you encounter, and most monsters before her are just like the raptors, the crabs, or the small wyverns like Kutku or Baroth. She teaches you roars, wind pressure, poison, and how to avoid charges. I feel like most hunters would agree that Rathian is not the best fight around, but she does deserve a spot on the old reliable shelf just for sheer consistent fights, patterns, and a hugely abusable chin. No matter what type of skill level you are, even average hunters can throw hands with the Queen of the Lands and come out looking good. The other monster we want to showcase is the Naga Cougar. Whilst it's not featured in as many games as Rathian for sure, Naga's always been a fan favorite, and for good reason. The fight, once again, has been almost equally as unchanged throughout the years, with a slight exception to that of Iceborne. Let's first discuss some hit zone values for this fight. Naga always had two main hit zones to look at. The head, of course, was its best spot for all weapons maintaining solid 50s across the board, whilst the arms and tail had been a lot tougher, usually around the range of the 30s. Nagakuga did have a dominant element hit zone though, which was of course its weakness to thunder. The arms, head, and tail have all had a very high thunder hit zone of about 30 to 35, though it does change with the games. This was important because of how bad the arm and tail hit zones were. You could still deal some serious damage with elemental weapons, and it's also one of the only ways to slow down Nagakuga was by using this arm topple when you broke its wings. This unfortunately does change when we get into 5th generation of Monster Hunter. See, 5th gen added head topple to Nargakuga, as they had for many monsters, to give players some downtime during a fight, so you no longer need to break his arms to do this, which is good because Capcom did gut most of the non-head hit zones in 5th generation. A weird change for Nargakuga for sure, as now with most monsters, you pretty much have to use Ra now to deal with them. 5th generation also gutted the gunner hit zones, something I'm still going to complain about despite gunners being broken. Long story. Anyway, Nargakuga was stripped of its usable head gunner hit zone in World and Rise and instead made the tail the prime spot. Which is kind of annoying because monsters, even Nargakuga being as agile as it is, isn't going to give you the rear for most of the fight. Rise's Nargakuga also loses that exploitable tail hit zone when enraged, so you have nowhere to target properly. So that's fun. Let's put the long round of hit zone changes aside. It is important though because we mentioned before monsters do change throughout the generations and hit zones do dictate how you need to approach a fight. And despite all the changes Nargakuga has seen, and we'll talk about it more, it's still very much a reliable fight that helps teach hunters how to approach certain aspects of the game. This thing is fast. Always has been, and always will be. Wild Nargakuga did hit the brakes a little bit, but that game in general was much slower paced compared to things like Generations. 
And unfortunately, with a bit of 5th gen syndrome here, Rise's Nagakuga didn't change much, so that's also feeling a little bit slow, compared with the Hunter, of course. But I digress, it's still relatively quick compared to other monsters, with a lot of mobility. It was always difficult to track Naga's movements, and most first-time Hunters found it to be a little bit overwhelming at times. The bright side of Toothless over here is it always had some very tight hitboxes with its attacks, which is very much dodgeable with no evasion skills. This was the fight where Hunters learned to iframe, and as much as I do bash on World's Nargakuga for being slow, it has some incredibly tight hitboxes, even too generous at times, but it does feel outlandishly good to roll through attacks and follow up with a quick punish. See, punishing the monsters for learning its moveset is what makes the entire game fun, that's the point of the franchise. If you don't think so, I have no idea why you're playing Monster Hunter. Anyway, Nargakuga gives players plenty of opportunities to punish, not just through precise attacks, but also because a lot of his attacks have a taunt or cooldown animation at the end. The double tail slams, the double tail swipes, and the triple jumps all end with Nargakuga raising its head to roar or lying prone, which does give you ample time to set up a big swing if you didn't get hit by the last attack. While Nargakuga is not as predictable or abusable as something like Rathian, the added openings give players plenty of room to attack. Of course, it's not always easy to iframe attacks and avoid everything, especially with how much Nargakuga jumps around, but hugging the monster and keeping it close gave the players much more control over the fight, allowing you to bait certain attacks or just get ready to dodge when it was about to crouch before it pounce. Sort of like the opposite of Rathian, which would punish the player for sticking close to it, Nargakuga was always trying to get off the player so it could lunge back in, so a skilled hunter who could follow it around would be rewarded with juicy openings after those big moves. Newer iterations of Nargakuga are more focused around this close-range iframing combat flow, whereas older Nargakugas would jump around with a mix of ranged and melee attacks. Both fights ended up playing in a similar fashion though. I just think 5th generation Nargakuga stays much closer to you than before. Nargakuga has also had this signature gimmick of its roar. Whenever you would deal enough damage to enrage Nargakuga, it would jump to the side before roaring at you, allowing you to reposition and get a swing in to try and stop the roar or just attack through it. Typically, Hunters were just used to monsters staying static and roaring at you, but again, this swift Wyvern's movement lets you know something else was up with this fight. Nar could also be forcibly enraged by throwing a Sonic Bomb at it, which gave the Hunters opportunity to force openings, since it did tend to be a bit more predictable when it was mad. Nagakuga and Rathian have both been great at teaching the Hunter how to properly play at certain distances. In a game as beginner unfriendly or as in depth as Monster Hunter, a good teacher or punching bag is completely invaluable. Whilst in this series we've spoken about the positives and negatives of new versus returning, it does have to be said that a few of those monsters that experienced hunters will understand how to tackle can also be great for player experience. Although, wouldn't it be awesome if the returning monsters weren't the Wrath and Diablos? Just one time, for just one game? That is basically all we got for now though. Thank you as always for watching, and thank you Sarah for being the co-host as always, I much appreciate it. Uh, if you guys want to check out the other videos in the series we do, check out mine and Sarah's channels and we'll put a link down below with everything. But yeah, anyway, thanks you guys. Good luck out there hunters, have fun.